The following burger patty that I'm about to walk you through is a combination of godly culinary research by Heston Blumenthal and other general detritus that collides with my brain during my constant traversing of the World Wide Web. At home, I am able to achieve something unimaginable by even the finest gastropubs, and I'm about to give you this knowledge for free. So buckle up for this two-part series because we're going to be making the most top-shelf, high-end, labor-intensive hamburgers you've ever seen. Seriously though, this burger is ridiculous, and it starts with one complicated step. Okay, psych, it's all pretty complicated. But the most important thing is that you've got to start with beef that has been ground in all the same direction. You know how when you get ground beef, there's these little noodles of meat that come out of the grinder. There are three ways to do this. Option one, grind the meat yourself. If you're the type of person who not only has a meat grinder, but knows how to properly use one, I don't imagine you're a fan of my fast and loose style of cooking and you're probably not watching this, so let's just rule that one out. Option two, talk to the person behind your meat counter. Now, I know if you're getting your culinary advice from 2 a.m. browsing sessions on YouTube in bed, you might have a little bit of social anxiety, but I have it on good authority that life behind the meat counter gets boring every once in a while, so maybe switch up your meat jockey's day here and there. Ask for special treatment. The third option, and my particular choice, is to get lucky and live next to a grocery store that already grinds their beef this way. If this isn't the case for you, suck it up, don't be a baby, and talk to your butcher. It's worth it. You should know that this is 80-20 ground beef, meaning that it's 80% lean and 20% fat. That's basically the standard for making hamburgers. Hamburgers are not a diet food, and if you use 90% lean beef, it's not gonna be good. It's really that easy. Remember, I did say that this was going to be labor intensive, so if you've gotta do a lot of wang jangling to make this work, don't be surprised. I'm just gonna give it a rough cylindrical shape and wrap it up with plastic wrap. I'm basically making a fiber optic cable of cow and just wrapping it up really tightly in the plastic wrap. The circumference of this cylinder is going to determine the circumference of your final patties after a little bit of shrinkage, obviously. Uh, but if you know what kind of bun you're gonna be using and what size that bun is, you'll be able to get the patty to be exactly the same size as your bun, which is always an enviable task. Once you've reached this point in the process, you're pretty much home free. As long as you've got everything really tight, there's nothing that could go wrong, because we're not even gonna season this, so there's no ratio that you could get wrong. It's really all about making a perfectly round and very tight cylinder of beef noodles that are all going in the same direction. This obviously is not watertight, so I'm gonna put it in a Ziploc bag and then cook it sous vide at 130 degrees, because I like my burger at a nice little medium rare. Well, surely you understand how this machine works because it's the only damn thing I've been using since I started this channel. Sorry but it's heating the water around the burger to exactly 130 degrees so that by the time everything heats through all the way, the edge of the burger, the middle of the burger, and the other edge are all one temperature all the way around. And that's exactly what we want. Perfect doneness. One of these days I'm gonna get to the point where I actually have enough foresight to say, and I already have one done right here, but today is not that day, so I gotta wait this out for an hour. I'm gonna spend the time cleaning all of the raw beef off of what is actually my bedroom dresser. This thing that I've been cooking on for a couple months is full of my underwear and socks. So, BRB. So what's the deal with this whole wackadoodle technique? Well, first of all, this is going to yield perfectly round patties that I can slice as thick or as thin that I want. I don't have to worry about making my patties too thick because there's no raw center to leave in the middle. It's already cooked all the way through edge to edge. But the real mind f here is that since all of the grains of beef are cooked while they're going in the same direction, the tenderness is unbelievable. If you think about it like this bundle of straws, it would be very hard to cut into them this way because of the way that they're lined up. But if you were to say cut through or bite through this bundle of straws perpendicular to the direction in which they're moving, there's really little resistance and it results in an incredibly tender final product. 
As with any meat cooked sous vide, you can dial the temperature up or down however you want it. I like a very steaky medium rare, so that's why I put it at 130, but you could go as high as 140 and the texture wouldn't suffer because of the work that we put in to the actual physical formation of the beef log. This burger, no matter what, is going to be softer than a whiskey dick because your chompers don't have to work to buy it through. Honestly, I know it sounds like I'm getting worked up about this, but it's shookening when you try it. It should be illegal. Once your little moo log is done cooking, it's best to chill everything down, right down to its central core. The reason for this is that cold beef is just a lot easier to slice. The added benefit to this is that you can leave this in your fridge for a couple days and just slice off segments as you need them, like some gigantic hoo ham. It's like I'm handling some beefy baby Jesus in his swaddling clothes. Go into the fridge. Mm. Y'all, please remind me next time never to build two hours of prep time into one of these stupid videos because I still haven't eaten all day and it's the middle of the damn day and I've had so many beers and I'm buzzing pretty hard and I just want to eat this burger. <laughs> Why would anybody want to be a vlogger when you can be a beef vlogger? Okay. Oh, it's so slick. Let's do this. You should be more patient than I was and leave this in the fridge and not drink a bunch of beer and then get too hungry. But I wanna see how this cross section is looking. Okay, do you see how these little beef noodles that were running all in the same direction are just leaving so much air in the middle of the patty that just makes it so tender, like texturally. You can visually see how superior this burger is to other forms of beef patty. The only thing that this baby is missing is a crust. Now, no tea, no shade, no pink lemonade to all you charcoal grillers out there. Shout out to Smoke Flavor. But this is an exercise in textural experimentation first and foremost. So I wanna make sure I get full contact with a hot cast iron surface so that I develop that deep mahogany crust. Again, even you could be doing this better than me because you don't have to film it and put it on the internet. You can use your legitimate cast iron pan, put it on a legitimate gas burner and crank it up all the way to high heat until it's smoking. Salt from up high so you get even coverage. Same with the pepper, make sure it's freshly cracked and not dust from an old McCormick canister. Some smoke is starting to emanate from my griddle. So that means it's time to get some butter down. The only reason I'm adding this butter is to make perfect contact from the patty to the pan, and this is this butter is the conduit. The higher the heat, the better here, because we're worried about crust and crust alone. And you know what? For far too long, burger enthusiasts have had to choose between a thick, juicy steak burger and a thin, pressed smash burger, what with its chitinous exterior. So delightfully crispy. No longer, my friend, do you have to worry about such tedious choices. Now you can have it all, because we've got that perfectly cooked 130 interior, big fat inch thick, and a super, super hard sear on the outside that's gonna get the best of every world and beyond. Flipping is not as easy as it sounds. In both love and in hamburgers, tenderness breeds sensitivity. So when you're flipping this sweet, sweet baby, be careful. I love the aroma of particulate beef fat wafting around my home. I suppose you could say it is my potpourri. It's a thing of beauty. It really is. You can actually see the textural superiority at play. You can see these little nooks and crannies of fat globules running their way through the valleys of this treacherous beef domain. I hate to wax poetic about it, but what I hate even more is that you will never experience this honestly, truly transcendental piece of culinary art unless you make it yourself. So I suggest that if you ever, ever get so much as the merest chance at attempting to make this, that you take it. At this point, you could slap this onto a cheap burger bun and call it a day. It'll still be the most spectacular hamburger you've ever had in your damn life. 
But I wanna show you how to dress it up in an even more idiotic and time consuming way next week. Although I think I have like 300 subscribers right now, so in a meta way, statistically speaking, most of the viewers of this video will watch it at a time where that video is already up. So you can watch it in the future now, because it's now the past. My perception of time is completely off. I've been filming this video for like five hours, and I'm so hungry, and I'm so buzzed, and I can't eat this thing until I make next week's video right now, so this is over. Watch the other one. Cut.